welcome to All Hell Can't Stop Us. This is, or I am Jeff Cliff, and this is a weekly podcast, a weekly broadcast and record of the time, and I have a shorter theme song, or at least a cutoff theme song this week, because someone suggested I have a shorter theme. I think it sounds kind of awkward, but I'm interested in feedback on that. If you like less theme, definitely tell me. But today I have a special guest, and this is a special guest who I am not super acquainted with, but who sent me a friend request a little while back. So, Thunder Bass, are you still online? I am still with you. And so I'm just going to point out that I have invited uh, quite a few, this show has been going on for close to two years now, and I've invited quite a few people from across the political spectrum, from the conservatives to liberals to socialists to uh, people on uh, all sides of the technology and music world. And so I am open to voices that maybe I may not 100% agree with on everything, being part of the conversation on this show. So hopefully I will be welcoming enough to you that you feel welcome here to, to participate Bay today. And so Thunder Bay says your name suggests you are in Thunder Bay. And so we were talking a little bit about the big deal in Thunder Bay as basically everywhere else in the world being COVID. And so you are doing your part and staying socially distant and staying kind of away from people. But other than that, what has been your experience with COVID in Thunder Bay so far? Let's start with that. Well, my experience with COVID in Thunder Bay, personally, I haven't seen COVID firsthand. We have a pretty tight community in Thunder Bay of people who like to go out and take part in a music scene. That's one of the main things that I miss right now because of COVID-19, like, because, you know, everything's been locked down. And, uh, and, <laughs> and as your name suggests, you, you are a musician. You, you you do play the bass. And so as far as the music world in Thunder Bay and the particular venues in question, they tend to be things like bars, weddings, that sort of thing. What kinds of venues would you normally be or what what kinds of uh, performances or, or places would you normally have access to that you don't currently have access to? Well, right now, there's no real venue for music in Thunder Bay, like no live venue. I mean, like the way the laws have it now, you're not even allowed to have music playing in your business over a conversation level. So as far as live performance goes, as soon as you throw a drummer in, that's out of the question. Okay. So the bars... And are, are the bars over, open over there? So Most of the bars are still open. They're open until 11 o'clock now. Some of them even have karaoke right now. So karaoke's okay, but live music isn't. Yeah, unfortunately. Sometimes it's a little bit of a scary okey situation, too. And are these rules concerning both bars and other things like it? Is this set provincially, or is it set at the city level, as far as the ones being in the way of musicians doing their thing? From what I understand, we are a little bit different with our rules than, say, Toronto. For example, I was working in Sioux Lookout this summer, and in Thunder Bay, we already had, if you go somewhere not outside where you cannot socially distance, you have to wear masks in Thunder Bay. It was still weeks until, say, Sioux Lookout, which is still in northern Ontario, had mandated masks. So it's, from what I understand, like, yeah, it's not, it's not the same across the border Ontario, which is not necessarily a, a bad thing. Right, because, like, Thunder Bay is a very different place than Toronto, and it is very, very far away. Having traveled that hop a good couple of times, so that, the, especially earlier in this COVID pandemic, Toronto had a really rough time. There were a lot of people getting infected, there was a lot of people having a lot of problems, and Thunder Bay either had no cases at all, or they would have, like, the one case that was in the hospital, and then people kind of freaked out about it a little bit. But it was just like that one case, or the, maybe like the, the case after that, right? Whereas we, we talked a little bit before the show about how the numbers for Thunder Bay are at either of our fingertips right now. But is it, like, it's spread enough that you're aware that, that it's spreading a little bit in the city, right? It is getting out of hand. Yeah. And it is starting to get there. I mean, Thunder Bay's been behind in all sorts of things, whether it's haircuts or clothing styles, and now COVID's kind of catching up with us, so... And I heard uh, uh, from a couple of friends that the pickleball community especially uh, started to spread it quite a bit there. Did you hear anything about that, by chance? Well, I heard a rumor that a couple of the people involved with who was organizing the pickleball tournament had been in Winnipeg. I mean, that's only, that's a rumor. There's no news stories specifically about that or the causation of, like, playing pickleball doesn't, in my mind, pickleball alone won't cause you to get sick. I mean, obviously somebody left our community and came back. That's kind of a, that's one of the rumors going around. And you mentioned that as well in terms of 
Thunder Bay being a, a city where people often travel to other places. It's got everything you need to basically survive in the city or to, to have a, a meaningful life, but a lot of people do travel to and from Thunder Bay, from places like Winnipeg. And so do you have any comment about that as far as people in your world, how many of them are still traveling, etc., or at least that you're aware of, if, if not kind of in your circles? Well, Thunder Bay is, it's, it's a very large city, and the surrounding area is very much connected. For 50 kilometers in any, any direction, there's communities that, even farther than 50 kilometers, but there's municipalities and communities that come into Thunder Bay all the time, even for groceries or whatever it is, and they're connected to people who live in the city. So I think there probably are people who are going out and having parties out in the boonies, as they said. As they would normally do, but this time of year or otherwise. I would imagine it's more like people who are younger, like in their 20s, who invincible, you know? And this kind of brings us to the point you were trying to bring up earlier, that there is a little bit of a choice with COVID in terms of how we can react to it really depends upon the value we see in other people and the value in terms of, for younger people especially, the chances of younger people having serious problems with it is lower than older people, people who have problems with morbid obesity, etc. There's various co-factors that you, we could get into in terms of how dangerous mm -hmm. COVID can be. Yeah, and so you were talking about a particular ethical problem that was kind of relevant. Do you want to describe that? Right, it's a psychopath test that I came across on YouTube one time. And the question is, if you could save a train car full of people by pushing a very large man in front of the train to stop it, that's the dilemma. <laughs> what would you do? Do you think this guy's, that, that this man, it would not be his choice to, to lay down his life to save these people. You would be taking the choice in your hands. Would so, you be so, able to... So you, who is the person who has the ability to push this man onto the track, have the choice of ending his life to save five others, right? And then the question right. is, do you do it? And so for, for you specifically, if you imagine in your mind what you would do in that situation, what would you do? Well, I think when we're in situations of high stress like that, that you have three basic reactions, fight, flight, or freeze. And knowing myself, I feel like I might freeze up in that situation. And that's a totally valid thing to do. It's worth pointing out that like, when faced with a stressful situation, especially one where you haven't considered it before running up to it, that sometimes we can be really hard on ourselves for the choices that we make in the immediate point where you have to choose and you have to make that decision. We can sometimes come across these kinds of theoretical ethical situations and run through the numbers or run through the implications of our choice. And if we had time to think about it, maybe come up with a different decision than the one we would make when actually pressed with it. But at the same time, when you are actually presented with that situation, if you haven't got that time to think about it, then there's something of a, an understanding, I think, that we should have for people who are in that situation, that this is one of the things that people are going to do. And so we, we shouldn't really blame people as much for making, maybe not even making that choice, but just having their body do that for them. And this is, I think that this particular kind of situation, this kind of constructed theoretical situation is interesting because even if your answer for this this kind of question is okay well i would freeze or or maybe we should freeze or or maybe we the thing that is most likely is that we are going to freeze i think it helps us imagine similar situations like let's for example look at covid right before covid happened we did have sars and from my understanding of the mortality rates of sars it was it tracked very closely to what the mortality rate of COVID was if there's no medical assistance available and if we hadn't learned a little bit, or at least how the, the doctors have learned a little bit of how to treat it. And so the mortality rate was closer to the 2% or the 3% rather than the little bit less than that, depending on what numbers you use. Maybe it's 99% survival or 99.9 .9 if the medical assistance is available now. But in either case, like how bad does it have to be before we act, right? And let's say if it instead of was five people, right? Let's say it was 50 people on the tracks or on in a car on the tracks in front of the train. Would you hesitate to push that one man over if you're saving 50 or 100 or 300, etc.? And so, I mean, on one hand, it's hard to, to draw that line exactly. But on the other hand, it's important that we start thinking of like, how much of a change can we do to the, the situation we have before we would act differently? 
So in the case of the trolley situation, another thing that you can do is pu physically pushing someone onto a track. That's a big action. Not a lot of people are going to have it in them to like push someone onto a track, right? But like, button, flip, maybe. yeah, pushing a button is much easier to do. So it, like in, in your case, like would, would you push a button to move someone onto a track or to have the, the train divert to a track and hits one person rather than five, for example, or is that still something that you would expect that you would seize up on? You know, in that sense, people, a lot of times in those situations do try to, what would you call it? The bystander effect. Yeah. You know, it's like, holy shit. Like, I don't want to, you know, like you'd hope that someone better than you would make the decision for you, even though like you are just a human like anybody else. And I will refer to, for those listening, I did do a show on the bystander effect. So definitely go listen to that one. But and another thing too, is that we can want other people to be better than us. Right. And this goes to something that Robin Hansen specifically, the Overcoming Bias blog, tends to kind of harp towards a little bit in that it's really easy sometimes to see what the right thing is to do. And, but doing it is another thing entirely, right? And if you can get away with looking down on people for their choices, sometimes that's an easy thing to do, especially on Twitter, right? Like where, or these big social media networks where we see other people very clearly. And we can always people find talk down on those things. Like they talk down to other people. A lot of times you see that. Yeah. If you want to find someone that you can talk down to, it's trivial now with the internet and all these big social networks to find that one person who you can see yourself as better than, but it's more difficult to see ourselves and to see in the, the heat of the moment to see ourselves and to say, Oh, I could, be doing this better, or I could, this choice ahead of me, if I choose to do it this way, future me will look down on what I'm doing right now, right? And so the tools that we've built around ourselves have been more disposed to the easy path of judging others. And I mean, there is something there as far as seeing our own actions and seeing our own impacts on the world. I think that there hasn't been as much effort put into that because it's more difficult, right? Yeah, well, everything moves at a million miles an hour these days. Information gets out, news stories get printed before they're verified, before journalists, journalism's even done on it, the who, what, when, where, why is not explained, or investigated. It's just a symptom of the technology we have now. So on that side, as far as trying to imagine better technology, if it wasn't for the actual constraints of, like, how technology works, do you have any vision or idea as far as what it could be or how we could approach whether or not the idea of holding ourselves accountable or the idea of journalism, etc. Like, what should it be doing differently, do you think? Well, I do think journalism has been kind of redefined as something where they don't really do a lot of investigation sometimes. They don't give you the who, what, when, or, or why. I think a lot of it has to do with the commercials you see in between the news stories as well. And that's kind of an important point. I watched TV for the first time in quite a while, this past maybe week or week and a half or so. And I was just stunned by like how just pervasive the commercials were and how it seemed to be a normal thing for people with TV in, specifically in their lives to, to have commercials in their world and to have for people who, who don't have ad blockers, for example, to have advertisements in their experience. As someone who's kind of lived in the periphery of the counterculture for quite a while, ads are not something that are as common in, in my experience, but I know for most people they are. But you also brought up an interesting point in terms of journalism at its best does the who, what, when, where, why, etc. So I guess we'll go back to the first page and start again with who are you and what, what defines you as Thunderbase? Let's start with that. Well, Thunder Bass, I've been playing music in the Thunder Bay area and across the northern shores for the better half of my life, and it's brought to me many positive learning experiences. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a con contributing member to the music and art scene in Thunder Bay. Okay. I guess so. I never really thought of it that way, but... It is an active and flourishing thing, right? Or at least flourishing enough, right? There are musicians in Thunder Bay. Yeah, it is. <laughs> and as a city, it does and has for a long time been a place where music happens. And it isn't just any old small, you know, any old town in terms of that. There really is something there. But as far as your positive learning experiences go, what would be an example of one of those experiences as a musician? Well, hmm. well you get to learn how to work with others very, very quickly if you want to be successful. And there's all kinds of people in the music music community. That, that's one thing. 
Another thing too, where you're saying how a lot of people take the easy path and would rather do that than look back on themselves with regret. With music, while you're playing, especially in a live situation, you get that instant feedback while you're playing your instrument. You hear it if it's off. And, and, it's really interesting. And, and, and I'll add to that, that you actually may even hear and notice it more than your audience does. Especially if you have like a really strong musical background, if you hit that off note, even if it's in a, a very dissonant chord and a very dissonant section of the music where there's a lot going on and someone listening outside may not hear that, oh, this particular <laughs> dissonant note wasn't the dissonant note you were supposed to play, right? But you hear it because you know what was supposed to happen. You practice, right? You know what to expect, and that broke your expectations as the person who knows what should be expected. Whereas the audience is like hearing all kinds of things, right? And they may not catch every single miss hit of a, a string or... Lesson though about that. There is a big lesson in music that I learned, not necessarily from just Thunder Bay, but from in general with life. There's two things. One thing is, as a bass player, if your feet aren't moving, if you're not keeping time with your feet, then the audience isn't going to be able to dance. You have to set that pace. You have to set that tempo. Okay. The other thing is, when you're in that moment and you make a quote-unquote mistake... What, what, what is the uh, Bob Ross uh, term, the happy accidents? Yeah. Exactly. There's no... There's actually no wrong note. On, there's no wrong note that you can play. There's notes... If you're starting to play, say, the wrong scale, for example, you're only ever one fret away from being in the right note to play in that scale. Right. So that being said, if you make a mistake, do it twice and learn from it as you're doing it. And then just next time, do it, do it differently. Right. Or, depending how it sounds, right? If you, Especially if you can find a way to record your own live show and kind of hear it back to yourself to know whether, oh, did it actually sound better than what I was going to play would be like one one question but it is, a, is a, that is actually a type of form of meditation that you can do say after you play a show is visualize it again so, so try even, e even if you don't have the recording to like just like mentally try to play it back to yourself is what what you're saying yeah. sometimes if you play like say three hour gig it's kind of overwhelming you just want to go to sleep but the next day in the shower think about think about what happened interesting idea it's like an extra practice level Right. Where, yes, you practice going up to and in the actual act, you are still like practicing. But that extra step, right, it is important sometimes to go that extra step if you want to really have the if you're really reaching for greatness to do little things like that, where if, if you want, I mean, anyone can go and then learn the set list at the last minute, go up on stage, and then forget about it. But there's definitely a place for people who are willing to go that extra mile. And if you've been around in the Thunder Bay music scene for this long, you've clearly done something right to have earned that place in that world, right? So that... <laughs> and, but it's, I also want to really harp on the point that you made in terms of the... It involves being at that level musically. involves working with other people. And... There's only so many people that define the Thunder Bay music scene specifically, but just any scene or, or any active community of, that has musicians making a living, et cetera, in it. And do you find, though, that sometimes that, that social part of it forms a barrier? And have you seen that barrier restricting you? Or have you always been on the right side of the barrier, et cetera? Do you have any experiences that's on that really side? Very, uh, very good question. Well, that's, there definitely are clicks in our music scene. And it's very frustrating for me. I come from a bit of a different background, a bit of an outsider. I didn't high school with all the guys necessarily, you know. Mm -hmm. And there's up and comers too, but the, they all kind of get pulled into the scene like a magnet. I'm not like, I, I personally do feel like a bit of an outsider because you see, you talk to some guys and they'll be like, wow, they're like, you're a great bass player. Like, I saw you play and I'd like to jam with you sometime. And then a couple of weeks later, you see, oh, oh, they got another bass player from the band they were just jamming. Like, you know, they are, <laughs> they have something going on already before. So it's like just easier, probably more. They already know the guy. Yeah. And, and it's also worth pointing out that, like, as a city, and more so than any other place I've ever been, Thunder Bay is a city of outsiders. There are people there that have been there for a long time, but there's also a significant portion of the city that at any given time is new to the city and is trying to make a go of it there. And so, that, I guess, first off, like, how long have you been in Thunder Bay? Um, I've been in Thunder Bay since 2009. 
And where where did you come from before that? The, a municipality called the municipality of Niebing. Niebing, it's okay. About, so that's about, that's uh, where the bridge is, right? Down, down Highway 61 from the city. So the closest thing, we were closer to the Pigeon Cross border crossing than uh, Pigeon River Pro, border crossing than we were to the city. Okay. So it was out, out in the woods. So how, uh, like, you're talking about the U.S. border when you're mentioning border, right? Yes. And so how far from the U.S. border is that? About a 10 minute drive. Okay. Because I noticed you're also living in Thunder Bay that because how close it is to the border, that you get like this access to America, American culture, etc., that other parts of the country don't have, right? It's more usual to have a passport, to travel to the States, etc. And so in your hometown, was that also as true? Or is it just like a part of the States where in order to get anywhere interesting, you have to drive for quite a while? Et well, it wasn't really a town. It was like, uh, I grew up on a really large piece of farmland. It was my great grandpa's. The closest neighbor was probably about uh, two kilometers away. <laughs> the closest neighbor we talked to anyways. And uh, yeah, I don't really know what you mean by about uh, U.S. influence on our culture there. Like, it was a happy culture of snowmobilers and fishers and hunters and, you know, <laughs> stuff like that. Okay. Fair enough. Fair enough. Like, for example, like... I. When I lived in Thunder Bay, one of the political things that was going on at the time was the Women's March. And there was a very, very close connection between the people who organized the original Women's March in the States and people in Thunder Bay. They were first cousins, or they were direct friends, or they were directly connected in some way, shape, or form. So that the ideas that they were trying to push for were shared very closely from one side to the other. And so it was, it was like a seamless from the outside in terms of that particular movement. You mean like in terms of the ideas and talking points? That would be part of it, but I think more along what people are, are interested in and what people are interested in talking about. Uh, and so the particular conversations that were being had on one side of the border seemed to be mirroring what was going on on the other rather than what perhaps may have been more in tune with the rest, what the rest of the country was talking about at the same time, that sort of thing. Of course, there's more than one conversation going on at any point, and that is worth pointing out as well. But so back on the being an outsider and being uh, from more the, the rural side of northwestern Ontario. So, so how did, did that impact, impact, especially like it maybe previous years closer to when you got to Thunder Bay, keeping you from jamming? Or, or having gigs, et cetera, et cetera. Well, on one hand, being an outsider has its advantages. I mean, those guys were, the inner circles, like, they're, they're very, very creative guys. Like, it's, it's an art, art, artistic powerhouse where I was playing more parties and doing covers and things like that. So I found my niche in the same sense. So what is your niche? <laughs> It's different now. I mean, last year I had a really great open jam that I was hosting at a, at the local uh, Pulisci's Wayland Bar in, in Thunder Bay. Okay. In, uh, you know, that's in Fort William. And that, I feel like that was a good niche for me. Good, a good gig for me. Every Thursday I would host open jams and we had some nights we had 15 musicians coming. We had regulars and I hosted it like nobody else did in Thunder Bay. In that, like, I got to knew everybody there, what they were playing, what instruments they play, their strengths, I'd ask people, like, what songs they know, and then I'd match them up and, and call them up onto the stage. Sometimes some people would be like, oh, I'd like to sing a solo acoustic. It's like, okay, but we had the whole PA set up and bass amps and guitar amps and a drum kit set up. It was a really good time, man. I really miss these days. And, like, is it... Are there any, I guess, going back to your, your kind of phrase earlier, like a, a learning experience so that at the Wayland, at the those open mic nights, is there anything in particular that you took away from that that was that you found to be really positive? Well, there's a situation that happens that this is kind of how I started getting into playing live music. And the man who, who kind of put me on the spot, he called it being thrown to the wolves. So in a situation where somebody comes up and says, well, I'm going to play a rock song, it's in the key of C, and it's a song... Like, maybe I've heard it before. Just being able to rely on the fact that it's okay, you know, go with it. Being thrown to the wolves, but you don't have to fight them, you know? Right. <laughs> feed, feed them with treats, give them a steak. <laughs> Speaking of strictly metaphors, you know? Yeah. So, again, as someone who's, like, been to the Wayland, has experienced the Wayland on the, on the musical side, did you find that they gave you enough creative leeway, maybe as the bands that you've played there? Was there an availability of... I guess, space, if you wanted to have, like, for example, a non-cover band 
Was that kind of an option for you? And how are you finding the venues in terms of allowing you to, to actually grow to your potential as a musician on that side? Pre-COVID. Very open. Interesting. From pre-COVID, obviously, <laughs> there's all kinds of venues all across Thunder Bay. The Wayland is a great venue for a band that wants to cut their teeth and really, really take it to the next level. A lot of the venues will give you, say, a 20-minute spot, maybe a 45-minute spot. But if a band really wants to cut their teeth and get good and figure out what makes people dance... I would say learn how to like play a show at the Whalen. Yeah, you play three 45-minute sets with 45-minute breaks in between. So you have to have some sort of show put together for that. You know, succeed at that. It's it's a completely different set of skills than it is to be like you have to be a performer as much as as much like it's an entertainment thing. Yeah, like like, like, like you were talking about with like, moving with your feet. Like it's one thing to have the skill as a, a musician to to sound good and to to have technically executed very well put together music but if it's not what the crowd is there to hear right or to if it's not engaging with the crowd enough that it's it's like it, you're you've wasted the opportunity that the whalen provides right and so on that side though do you find that there is or again pre-covid that there was a movement towards people being used to more electronic, maybe dubstep or hip hop, something along those lines in terms of music constructed not on the spot or not by human hands on stringed instruments today. And did you find that impacted you at all or was there always a space for your bass? There's been room for both actually. Thunder Bay is a very diverse city when it comes to music taste and entertainment. There's a huge classic rock following in Thunder Bay. Bands come through all the time. Yeah, it's been really good. There's always nightclubs that are popular that play the DJ music and stuff like this and even some of the bars in town will have nights like that like regular nights and it's a very uh, diverse set of tastes we have very very eclectic i'd say so on the diverse taste side what one of the things that thunder bay has going for it is a divide between various types of groups and what one of the groups that uh, again has been kind of on the outside uh, has been the uh, first nations groups in terms of in my experience a lot of the bands that i saw tended to not have uh, any First Nations people in it. And there, there is this Anishinaabe community. There is this Fort, Fort William First Nations community. There is a Métis community there. But a lot of the time it seemed to be disconnected from things like, for example, we, there is a Blues Fest, right? Now, there are people on the musician side who are definitely First Nations, Métis, etc. But it seemed like from the vantage point of someone who was there, again, as an outsider, that there was kind of old boys club on that side. Did you have any experience on that side or how did you see that dynamic? Well, one of my favorite performers is actually, his name's Arden, and he's been performing in Thunder Bay for, God, I don't even know, since before I was born. But he's one of the most well-respected musicians in Thunder Bay, and I guess you would describe him as First Nations. As far as, like, there being some sort of club, it is very clicky, man. And I myself am not First Nations, but I do find it is clicky. And in terms of imagining a Thunder Bay going forward, embracing more musicians from the First Nations or the Métis side. Is there any suggestion in terms of how to move forward, how to get some of those barriers down from your side? Yes, I do, actually. There is a business in Northern Ireland that I would love to take, steal the model of. But what they end up doing is, it's like a community center where they have all these musical instruments and music lessons and they do recordings. And I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure it's like next to nil to, to go there and take part because it's funded somehow. Do, do you know the name of this place in Ireland? Sorry, I'm not sure. It's in Northern Ireland. Southern Lyon or Belfast. And where did you get exposed to this? Like, where is this coming from? It seems kind of out of the blue to pick a place it's in the a world like that. Cool. I have family in Lyon. Okay. In Northern Ireland, yeah. So did you visit them and then experience this on that side, or you just hear it through the, the family tree, grapevine? Well, I, I am part of, I did join lots of community groups over there, so, on Facebook, so. Oh, okay. <laughs> Not to plug Facebook, but... So, in terms of... Now, back to, the, like, the COVID thing. Looking forward, as we continue to have this problem <laughs> where being around other people is not working very well for us, either here in Saskatoon or in Thunder Bay, do you see where live music can go? Or what can musicians do to position themselves to make it through this? Uh, or do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah. Play your boots, put new strings on, and keep rocking. Like, that's all we can do, man. It's really tough right now. It's kind of like a part of the motivation of wanting to play music is wanting to share it with others. And I feel like there is too much of a barrier 
when you're performing to a camera, to people who are on another side of a piece of glass who can't, you know, throw a tomato at you if they think you suck. <laughs> and, and having that feedback to know, like, when you've done something that the audience isn't resonating with, that, that's a, an important part as well. Now, have you heard of the, the CASE Act uh, in the States at all? No. No, they oh, say, um, there is a bar. On this note, I believe there are two places in Thunder Bay, two bars that are hosting open jams. I have not attended, uh, you know, but but that, that's a side of it. Okay, that, that's that's basically an anecdote. Like, so there are places I think that are still hosting open jam music, but I don't know for how long. And I also noticed this is probably maybe you've noticed this as well. But here in Saskatoon, we we just had a city election, and it was really obvious that the people who were more successful at politicking at going and getting their message out were the ones who had no problem being in large groups of people during this pandemic and who didn't have, for example, people in their lives that were older or more at risk. And so they were able to get away with, or politically, that they didn't care or didn't believe in COVID. They were able to get much further. Whereas like those of us who do care and who are uh, trying to be careful, that there was, the doors were closed. And I'm imagining, and you can correct me if I'm kind of on the right track here, that the, the music world is doing the same thing, where the, there, if there are places where you still can jam and you still can perform, that the musicians who are getting the gigs are the ones who don't care. And do you see that kind of incentive at play? And like, do, do, is there a kind of worry on your side that the musicians who don't care are the ones that are kind of making the are getting butter on their bread right now? Well, I mean, you always have to have a day job. Even Superman had one, man. <laughs> Even Peter Parker was a photographer. He needed money. So music has got, you have to have a plan B, right? That's one thing when it comes to getting your bread. I've seen posts from bands that have been in Thunder Bay for years and years, well-established bands. And I've seen one recently, a band called The Roosters, a great, great blues band. They went down to Memphis because they won a blues competition and they played some gigs there as their prize. Anyways, their singer slash guitar player, he's moving to do more solo acoustic stuff. I don't know if that's an indicator, but it's pretty easy playing bass right now, man. I'll tell you that much. <laughs> I believe it. <laughs> so we are up against the end of the show right now. So is there any last thing you'd like to get through to the world now that you got the world's attention? Well. Live long and prosper. Well put. All right. Well, thank you very much for participating today. Hopefully there's been enough common ground that we can have these positive learning experiences from each other. And No worries, man. Thanks for having me. No problem. And for those of you out there who are listening, just as a reminder, there is a subscribestar.com slash Jeff Dash Cliff. If you're interested in hearing from perhaps more musicians. Uh, so uh, with that, I will head out uh, with... Uh, the goodbye song today and uh with that i will see you all next week